Madam Clerk, please call the roll to establish a quorum. Senator Jones. Here. Senator Shoemaker. Senator Rocca. Here. Senator Bita. Here. Mr. Chair, you have three members present, a quorum. Very well. We will first uh, need a motion to adopt the minutes from July 26, 2012, with unanimous consent. Moved by Senator Bita without any objections. The minutes are adopted. We'll now take up testimony on Senate Bill 989. Senator Hopgood or staff here to testify? My name is uh, Kevin Sylvester. I'm the legislative director for, for Senator Hopgood. And uh, with me is Amy Carnes, one of our constituents who will be uh, also testifying on, on the bill. Senator Hopgood is uh, in appropriations, but uh, I'll just go over a little of the, uh, the, the bill and then uh, uh, kind of uh, let Amy speak a, a little bit about her experience, uh, if that's okay. Um, I first want to thank the, uh, the committee for uh, taking up this piece of legislation. I think it's, uh, it's very critical. Um, it came to us uh, last year by by Amy, who's, uh, who's one of our constituents, who kind of um, made us aware of some of the, her grave concerns about uh, Michigan's laws as they relate to sex offenders. Um, our statutes go to great lengths to protect children from sex offenders unless they are a child and not a victim of that sex offender. While an offender can be prohibited from having any contact with any children, or from even being in areas frequented by children, such as schools, playgrounds, and parks. Our current laws allow that parent to have unsupervised visitation of his or her own child. Uh, it is only after a parent commits a sexual crime against their child that our legal protections finally apply. Um, as such, Senator Hopgood's legislation aims to close these loopholes in the law and ensure that all children are protected from sex offenders. Um, specifically, uh, the law, the proposal uh, applies to Tier 2 and uh, Tier 3 sex offenses um, and proposes doing the following. Uh, incorporate provisions uh, similar to Nebraska's law on prima facie evidence that states that unsupervised vis visitation with a child by a sex offending parent is prima facie evidence that the child is at significant risk, thereby raising the standards so that a minimal level of only uh, supervised visitation would be allowed because the child would uh, otherwise be put at risk. Uh, it would uh, allow the child to have a say if they are old enough to make that determination. Um, it would permit the non-offending parent to prohibit the sex offending parent uh, custody or parenting time. Um, it would also allow the court's discretion by having them determine first that the non-offending parent is a fit parent and is making that decision in the best interest of their child's health, safety, and or protection. If the judge decides the non-offending parent is fit and is acting in the best interest of the child's health, safety, and or protection, then that parent would be able to exercise the ability to deny the custody or parenting time. If the, chi if the child, if old enough to make a determination, would have to concur. Um, if the judge were to say no, the, uh, then he or she would be required uh, to state in writing why the, the parent is not fit and why the parent is not acting in the best interest of the uh, uh, child's health, safety, and or protection. Um, if there are any, any questions about uh, kind of the, the nuts and bolts of the bill, I'd be happy to answer them, but um, I'd really like to have uh, Amy Carnes kind of testify to her, her own experience. Okay, we have Amy Carnes from uh, State of Michigan Children. Yes. Go ahead, please. Thank you so much. I would also like to thank you very much for allowing me to come here today and testify on behalf of this four-year very long journey um, that I've been, um, had no choice but to embark on on um, behalf of my daughter and the countless other Michigan children. Um, again, my name is Amy Carnes. I'm a mother. I'm also a school teacher, public school teacher here in Michigan. Um, and also I've been, become a voice and an advocate for my daughter, trying to protect her from a system that has completely failed her. I stand here today advocating for my daughter and the countless Michigan children whose innocence is unnecessarily at risk because our laws do not go far enough to protect them from sexual abuse. My story began in 2008 when my husband was arrested for soliciting sex from countless children for approximately four years, if not longer, from what the prosecutors um, have told me. And I've um, 
I've been able to obtain all of the transcripts and the chats and witnessed firsthand the conversations that he had with these young children. I had been married to this man for two years and the entire time he was soliciting sex from young girls. On August 21st of 2008, my world flipped upside down. On that day, my daughter was only 15 months old. Um, I'm a school teacher, so I was off for the summer, and uh, my husband just didn't come home from work that day. Um, I had no idea what happened. My little sister's a CSI detective in Miami, and she called every nearby police department, hospital. We had no idea what was going on. And finally, after numerous phone calls and research, we found out that he was arrested for soliciting children on the internet and put in jail. Once I recognized and processed what he was capable of by reading his online chats, my thoughts immediately turned to our daughter. I instantly filed for a divorce and I subpoenaed, once I found out my rights through law that I could subpoena for the transcripts and what he was capable of, I subpoenaed for the transcripts. My little girl was only 15 months old at the time of his arrest. She was non-communicative at the time, so I will never know if anything ever happened to my daughter. At that moment, all I did know was that it was time for me to do all I could as a mother, and that was to be proactive and protective. This is when I found my purpose in this personal nightmare and my role as an advocate began. Throughout the duration of my ex-husband's trial, the friend of the court granted supervised visitation. I was forced to sit in a room with a man who solicited children, fully intending to commit the most vilest acts our society knows and watch him interact with our precious daughter. Going forward, what would prevent him from committing similar acts against her? I was told by a friend of the court that after three months, of once he was released from prison, he would get three months of supervised visits and then from there he would have the opportunity to earn complete unsupervised visits with my little girl. There was no way I was going to allow her to be his next victim. The year, was followed, the year that followed provided a crash course on the criminal justice process for myself. Being an educator, I had absolutely no idea about the, the criminal justice process and it led me to draw two key conclusions. First, there are many excellent, upstanding, well-intended and helpful people involved in this system from the detectives who built the case against my ex-husband to the judges and attorneys who have helped me understand the legal process and helped bring justice for the victims of my ex-husband's predation. Second, there's, serious, there's a serious void in Michigan law when it comes to protecting our children. There is nothing in statute to prevent a child from being handed right back in a right back to a parent who has been convicted of sexually abusing another child. Working in a school district, there's a current program called the CSI program, and it's, fund, it's funded through the Attorney General's office, Mike, Attorney General Mike Cox, and they come into public schools on a yearly basis in the beginning of the school year to educate children today on cyber safety initiative and educating them on internet safety and how to um, stay away from sexual predators online. It's a wonderful program, but my concern is that when my little girl is sitting in this assembly, when she's in school in public education, she's going to wonder and ask her mother why she has to be around a sex offender when all the other children are being taught to stay away because they're dangerous people via our sex offender registry. My ex-husband was released from prison in late 2010 and will have completed the terms of his parole. The judge will have complete discretion over whether this man will be able to spend time with my daughter again. The fact that he could have access to her is sickening. In Michigan's current laws, everyone else's child is protected from this man but mine, and I want to know how this is possible. In addition, there's nothing to stop him from gaining partial custody and visitation of my daughter, despite the fact that he has a record of soliciting sex from children. Knowing this decision was looming, I opened a case with Child Protective Services. Their response? Current state law would not allow them to intervene because he had never touched my daughter. I was shocked. My child's innocence could be stripped by this man in just one visit if a judge allowed it. Child Protective Services sat at my kitchen table twice and told me there's nothing they can do until I have proof, until my ex-husband places his hands on my daughter. The state of Michigan is a very honorable state and I'm proud to live here, but I want to know why it's not proactive in regards to this situation. I shouldn't have to wait. I began researching the issue, digging up any information I could come across and talking to anyone who would listen. It turned out other families were facing the same issue. In fact, some judges were even granting unsupervised visitation to sex offending parents upon their release from prison. Excuse me, sorry. Uh, state law protects children at school, in church, at daycare, and countless other places that sex offenders are restricted from being near, yet my daughter does not enjoy these same protections. We need to do more to protect our children. Thankfully, my research and conversations led me to the door of State Senator Hoon Young Hopgood. Senator Hopgood has helped me pull together stakeholders and draft legislation to protect families in situations similar to mine. In Michigan, we have over 44,000 sex offenders, and in my research, we have 36,000 of those 44,000 that currently have children. 
This legislation is called the Children's Protection Act, and it's for a reason, because our children need to be protected. This legislation would eliminate a real risk facing Michigan children by preventing them from falling into the care of parents who have known records and were convicted of sexual predation against children. Under current Michigan law, the most egregious child sex offenders can still be granted custody of their own children as long as the sexual act was not against them. This legislation will only pertain to the most serious offenders. These are people who have or intended to commit the most offensive acts against children. The discrepancy in Michigan's current law is clear and troubling. It will allow men and women like my ex-husband to have unsupervised visitation. I am told that since there is no proof that he sexually abused my daughter and since he attended the sex offender therapy program, he poses no risk to my child. Yet he poses a risk to everybody else's child because he's placed on a sex offender registry in Michigan for 25 years, keeping everybody else's child safe to the point where he can't congregate at parks, live within, live within a thousand feet of a park, school, anywhere else where other people's children congregate, but yet he's allowed to be within reach of my child. This legislation will at the very least demand supervised visitation with a sex offending parent and their child. These precious children in our honorable state of Michigan do not deserve to be left unattended with men and women who commit the most vilest acts against children. I'm asking that you please support Senate Bill 989, and I thank you very much for allowing me this opportunity to speak before you today. Thank you. Senator, did you have anything to add? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to express appreciation for taking this issue up and uh, for listening to the, the testimony. Um, we think that we have a, a real issue here, and I think that um, Amy has been a, an outstanding advocate for the, the situation, the, the ins and outs that uh, parents face um, across the state. Um, what we have just tried to do is craft a solution that um, is appropriate. So, so we don't have a, a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, we actually have a policy that allows for uh, judicial discretion um, and, and that can meet a variety of different instances appropriately um, while also addressing the concerns that Ms. Carnes has raised. So we appreciate your time and we'd um, you know, ask for any uh, support in, in the future on this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, for bringing this important matter to us. Uh, do we have any questions? Seeing none, uh, thank you. Uh, I have a card from Bill Candler, Family Law Section of the State Bar, opposing the bill. I have a card from uh, Bill Candler, Michigan Probate Judges Association, opposing the bill. I have a card from Mary Lovick, the Michigan Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Prevention and Treatment Board, uh, supports the bill in concept. I have a card from Kathy Hag Hagnian, uh, Michigan Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence supports the bill in concept. Thank you. That bill was posted for testimony only. We will vote on that in the next committee hearing. We we'll now ask uh, Senator Knopf to come forward with a testimony on the Senate Bill 1043. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, committee members, and I do have a guest with me that, if it's appropriate, would like to be able to testify, uh, actually, a uh, server, an actual server, so I'll give you some pertinent uh, testimony, if you'll allow that today. I appreciate it. appreciate you taking up the bill, and uh, with me today is, like I said, was Mr. Jeff Kilpatrick, a certified court officer from Jackson County, and Senate Bill 1043 adjusts the fee schedule by which those who uh, serve in the civil service process through, throughout our state and uh, how they are currently compensated. The rates have not been uh, adjusted since 2006, and as Mr. Kirkpatrick can attest, in many cases do not come close to even covering the cost of the service uh, provided. If you'll keep in mind uh, as you look at the bill that uh, because of the way it is written, the actual fees being paid today are not necessarily reflected. For example, because the fees adjusted uh, by $1 in, $1 in 2004, 2005, and 2006, the actual fee being collected today under subsection 1A on page 1 is not $18, but rather $21. So I wanted to bring that to your attention. So under this bill, the current bill before you, 
we are not going from a fee of $18 to $23 in the first year. We're actually going from a fee of $21 to $23. The same is true for the SD substitute for a year. They're supremely agile. Attempts to address the issues raised in the 1997 case by allowing a process server and client signatures to negotiate fees that are different than the ones contained in this bill, so long as both parties agree up front and in writing. Again, I'll have Mr. Kirkpatrick can provide some operational insight as to why that is desirable in this bill. However, regardless of whether the fees end up being those as outlined in the bill or something that is separately negotiated between the two individuals, the most that a court could order a losing party to pay in terms of the process service cost would be the amounts provided in the bill presently in front of you. So it really provides a fallback to prevent someone from being assessed higher fees. So there is a floor. I'd like to now turn it over to Mr. Kirkpatrick, who has some brief remarks. But I do have, and read yesterday's Battle Creek Inquirer paper, and in there it said that there was an officer among the three killed in a Texas shooting, and it was basically a constable process server who was bringing an eviction notice to a home. And he was killed, and three other police officers were wounded, and a bystander was also wounded. So we have four wounded and one dying just from an eviction notice and taking that notice to the individual. And sometimes it doesn't always occur, but it does occur. This is a very dangerous job, and these individuals and police officers, we don't have enough of them to be able to serve all these papers, so we go to this type of process. But still, it is a very dangerous, dangerous job. And I just wanted to bring that to your attention because it's very relevant today, and it's just within the last couple days that happened in Texas. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Kirkpatrick now, if that's allowable. Hi. I am a court officer and also the legislative director for the Michigan Court Officer Deputy Sheriff's Association. And as Senator Noss indicated, this is really a modest increase for private sector process servers to serve civil process in Michigan. And as he indicated, the last time it was increased was in 2003, and I will tell you that the legislature at that point had passed the House 107 to 1 and the Senate 37 to 1. It is important to note that it's a user fee. It's not a tax. The party requesting the service is the person who's paying for that service, just like when someone calls and hires a plumber. Our association worked closely with the Michigan Creditors Bar Association, which represents probably 80 percent of the parties who use and request service of process from process servers in Michigan. They fully support the language in S-2 before you today, and I believe yesterday they sent a letter to the chairman confirming this. We did make that minor adjustment, as Senator Noss talked about, to allow to really memorialize, I guess, in statute what was already determined by the Court of Appeals in a case. And I guess I would just ask for your support of this bill. Thank you. This is a very tough job. I have personally done it, just as you, and it's very difficult. So I appreciate you bringing this bill forward. Do we have any questions? No. Thank you. Thank you. We now invite up Larry Julian for the Michigan Council of Professional Investigators. Supports the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Delighted to be here before you. When you think of the Michigan Council of Professional Investigators, you think of private eyes or private investigators, and that's exactly what they are. However, many of our professional investigators do serve process. And I'll just give you a slight example of the reason for opening this up for fee structure. We certainly support this bill in its entirety, especially S-2. And we are of the opinion that there are times when a normal service won't work. For example, if someone wants to make it bad on somebody because they're serving process on them, so they may want it served on Christmas Eve. And so an investigator obviously is going to charge a little bit more to them to take Christmas Eve away to go serve that process. And in this bill, they can do that under agreement with the party requesting the service. And if, in fact, then there is a judgment, the only thing that the defendant can be required to pay is the statutory amount of the smaller amount that's in the legislation. So we support it. Senator Knopf and his office and Mr. Kirkpatrick have been very cooperative in making those adjustments for us. So 
we appreciate you taking this bill up. Very good. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Seeing none, thank you. Uh, now I invite up uh, Patrick Clausen, supports the bill, wishes to speak. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Pat Clausen from Flint. I'm a process server and a legal investigator. I am a member of the Michigan Council of Professional Investigators and also a member of the Michigan Court Officers Association, which Mr. Kirkpatrick represents. I'm also the legislative director for the Michigan Process Servers Alliance, although I am not appearing here today in that capacity. I'm hearing, uh, here today in my individual personal capacity. I'm the fellow who serves papers. I have a little bit of a unique practice here in Michigan because I specialize in dealing with the extremely hard to serve, civil fugitives, hardcore evaders. It's very difficult. It's very dangerous work. I'm assaulted generally every week to 10 days in this process, as recently as last Saturday night in Ohio, where I've been tracing an evader that a number of court officers, including the president of the Michigan Court Officers Association, have been unsuccessful in finding over the past year. That case from Saturday night highlights partly why reforms are needed in this bill. In this case, the defendant had a court order issued out of Monroe County Circuit Court on them. They had been evading court officers and process servers for almost one year. I located the individual in Toledo, Ohio. After a multi-hour stake out of her residence, I served her at 3 a.m. on the morning, Saturday morning, in Toledo, Ohio, with the order out of Macomb County. Despite having to make four trips from Flint to Toledo over a period of uh, several weeks to try to locate this gal and get her served, I can only charge a statutory fee of roughly $50 for the entire service because on the way on how the state statute currently sets fees. Uh, I took this case because it involves a major client of mine. They had a specific problem that had to be handled that no other court officer in Michigan could appear to get taken care of. I got it taken care of. But to make four trips from Flint, Michigan to Toledo, Ohio for a total fee of approximately $50 is absolutely absurd. And under current state law, it's a criminal and a civil offense for me to requ even request a higher fee. I run into these kinds of situations all the time. It is not uncommon for me to get papers from an attorney in Detroit to serve somebody up in northern Michigan. About two years ago, I had a case that came out of uh, the Detroit area. Uh, after making multiple attempts to locate the individual, I finally determined that the individual was up in the Petoskey area. I went up and served him, again, at a terrific loss. In that particular case, I was physically assaulted by the individual. He drove an automobile at me, he attempted to roll me over a couple of times. He was ultimately charged with felony assault on a public officer. In that case, I didn't even get paid for the case because the attorney in the case said, well, you didn't get him served. These are the kinds of abuses that exist now under the current statutory scheme. So we need to be able to have some ability here for me to be able to contract with attorneys to be able to at least recover my costs when we agree to take on their cases. Right now, the way the law is drafted, the only time you can get paid is, is if you actually physically serve someone. And the fees for doing that in Michigan right now are among the very lowest in the nation. I will tell you that even though this bill increases fees by only about $2 per paper, I've already provided the committee with information that these fee increases actually represent a pay cut. When you figure in the rate of inflation since the last fee increases took effect back in 2006, you'll calculate it out and you'll see that for all of these increased fees, they actually represent a pay cut to us, ranging from 4% to almost 7.5% but at least some increase is helpful to be able to cover costs. And if we have the ability in the law to be able to privately contract other fees with counsel, knowing that they cannot recover any excess fees as a taxable award in court, then that goes a long way to helping to level the field here and allow us to be able to actually just even recover costs. So I support this bill and I thank you for considering it. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Do we have any questions? See, none. Thank you. Nell Kunmich from the District Judges Association uh, supports the bill, would like a minor technical amendment, but supports the bill. Phil Hoffman of the Michigan Court Officers and Deputy Sheriff's Association uh, supports the bill. Is available for any questions? Seeing none. Very well, we will be moving on. Uh, we'll take this up uh, in our next committee meeting.
Moving on with the agenda, uh, we had a bill that was assigned here by mistake. Uh, it was a package of three bills, and one got assigned to this committee. It needs to go to appropriations. I will make a motion that Senate Bill 1179 be moved to the Senate Committee on Appropriations with recommendation. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Senator Jones. Yes. Senator Shootmaker. Yes. Senator Rocca. Yes. Senator Bita. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have four yeas and zero nays. Bill is reported. We'll now take up House Bills 4834, 4851, 4853, 4856. We've already had testimony on these bills. I will read in the cards that we have today. <clears throat> Mark Leisure, representing R.C. Randall, opposes the bill. Matthew Abel, uh, attorney and director for Michigan NORML, uh, opposes the bill. Rick Thompson, medical marijuana radio show, opposes the bill. Steve Sharp from Jackson, uh, opposes the bill. Daniel Solano of Detroit opposes the bill. Richard Clement of Lansing of the Ingham County uh, branch of Normal opposes the bill. Uh, oppose the bills. The, yeah. Uh, Noah Smith of the Criminal Defense Attorneys of Michigan opposed 4834, support 4851, support 4853, neutral on 4856. Yeah. Well, the rest were all opposed. Uh, Joe Kane of Battle Creek opposes the bills. Shelley Edgerton of Lara uh, supports the bills. Tim Beck of the Coalition for a Safer Detroit supports 4834, is neutral on 5851. Gersh Avery, medical marijuana out of Dexter, opposes the bills. David Brogren, Cannabis Patients United of Birmingham, opposes the bills. Jeff Romano uh, from Detroit opposes Bill 4834. See no further cards. <clears throat> we have a uh, substitute. Judiciary Committee in the House spent several months in work groups, committee hearings to address many of the issues dealing with the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act. Uh, they met with all interested parties the package of bills deals with several concerns, having a bona fide physician-patient relationship, so individuals getting medical marijuana cards from a legitimate doctor meet the doctor face-to-face, -face, not over the Internet. They require that marijuana plants being grown outdoors are in an enclosed, locked facility, not visible. Certainly, we don't want children and other people without cards to have access to the plants. They set up a process for transfer of medical marijuana in vehicles. This is for safety of all parties involved. They will allow Lara to privately contract parts of the medical marijuana program to a private entity should they not be able to keep up with the applications. And they require patients and caregivers to have their registry identification with them to verify they are indeed medical marijuana patients. There's a substitute for House Bills 4834, 4851. These were to work out a couple of issues. In House Bill 4834, the photo ID requirement was taken out because they were not able to do it. It does allow Lara to enter into a private contract 
at the request of the department. In House Bill 4851, the uh, affirmative action defense was adjusted, the language, based off the Supreme Court decision in May. We also required that patients and caregivers be Michigan residents, and we banned felons from being caregivers. I'm also offering an amendment to the S-1 sub for House Bill 4834. The amendment will allow prosecutors access to the medical marijuana registry. This is done for purposes of drug deferrals. It will also change to may or to a shall on page five with regard to the department allowing access to the registry for law enforcement. Finally, it fixes a grammatical error on page 8, line 24, 25, changing a to, to, and of. We'll now take up the first bill, House Bill 4834. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I want to thank everybody that worked on this because I know there was a considerable amount of work on it. Um, specifically, I've got a couple concerns uh, on, on, on 4834 and 4851, and, and I know we're on 4834, so I'm just going to address the concerns on that. I'm a little concerned about the real broad definition of law enforcement officers that have access to the lien system. Um, really quite concerned about perhaps a, an abuse of that, and I was wondering if we can tweak that language to make it a little bit tighter, a narrower definition on uh, law enforcement officers. And, and I'd be happy to uh, work with the House uh, to narrow that. Uh, sounds reasonable, and uh, we could do that at a floor sub. Sure. <coughs> okay, we'll take up House Bill 4834. Uh, I move we adopt Amendment 1 to the S-1 substitute for House Bill 4834. Madam Clerk, please call the roll on adopting the amendment. Senator Jones. Yes. Senator Shoemaker. Yes. Senator Rocca. Yes. Senator Bita. Yeah. Yes. Senator, or Mr. Chair, you have four yeas and zero nays. The amendment is adopted. I will now make a motion to adopt the S-1 substitute as amended to House Bill 4834. Move to adopt the S-1 substitute. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Senator Jones. Yes. Senator Shootmaker. Yes. Senator Rocca. Yes. Senator Bita. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have four yeas and zero nays. Substitute is adopted. I move to report House Bill 4834, S-1, as amended, as a clean substitute with recommendation the bill then pass. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Senator Jones. Yes. Senator Shootmaker. Yes. Senator Rocca. Yes. Senator Bita. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have four yeas and zero nays. Bill is reported. I move to recommend immediate effect without any objection. The committee will recommend immediate effect. House Bill 4851. I'll uh, move to adopt the S-1 substitute. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Wish to speak on that? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, we're going through the substitute on this, and there was a couple changes that I'm, I'm really concerned about. One of them is the def changing of the definition of person to Michigan resident. Um, not only does it raise equal protection concerns, but I think just because somebody's not a Michigan resident doesn't mean that they're not protected by Michigan laws, and I'm, I'm wondering why, if there's a history to that, why we have to make that change in the sub. I do have an amendment to change it back to person, which I'd like to, uh, to offer uh, when it's appropriate uh, in committee. Okay, there, there, there has been a history of problems. Uh, was reported uh, by the state police of people coming in from other uh, states, uh, renting houses, uh, filling them up with marijuana plants, uh, without the, the owner of the home's uh, knowledge, then harvesting uh, their plants and taking them to Chicago to sell. So it was felt that uh, it was very inappropriate to allow this, that certainly somebody should be a resident and not come into Michigan and utilize the, uh, the law inappropriately. And uh, Senator Shoemaker actually had that occur in her district. Go ahead, Senator. It, it's just a technical thing. I think, I think you're going to have a problem with equal protection in, in law if this ever does get challenged, and I'm wondering if some little tighter language um, and not using the, the word, so we're not just 
distinguishing between a person within the United States. Um, uh, just maybe there was a requirement that they have a card or something, but it, I think the definition here is going to be problematic in a court looking at it. Um, I think there's an equal protection argument. There's a lot of case law on that, and, and I'm, I'm putting that as a, as, a, as a warning sign that I think this, this may need, section needs to be thought out a little bit more fully, understanding what the problem is, but at the same time, maybe this isn't quite the solution to what we're being proposed. I'd be willing to put you on a, uh, in a meeting with the House, and uh, you can discuss that. I would have no objection to some change, but I do think that you should be a resident. And, and totally understand where you're coming from on this, and I'm respectfully offering this as a uh, uh, constructive criticism that this is a uh, potential problem with the law on this, and I think we, we should consider what we're doing with this part of it. Okay, you have an amendment you wish to make for, uh, for the ACLU? It's, this is to the S-1, which we haven't adopted yet. Oh, okay. Well, it's a it's an amendment to the S one. If it's appropriate, I'd like to go ahead and speak that. to your amendment. Uh, all it does is it amends uh, page four, line twenty two, strikes out Michigan resident and and goes back to the original language as it passed the House by inserting person. Uh, I could, okay, that's uh, uh, okay. We've had all this pent up uh, amendment demand over the summer because we haven't met in about a month, so. <laughs> Okay, well, Senator Bita has made a motion that we adopt his amendment. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call a roll. Senator Jones? No. Senator Shoemaker? No. Senator Rocca? No. Senator Bita? Yes. Mr. Chair, you have one yay and three nays. The motion fails. Okay, we'll move on then. I will move to adopt the S1 substitute. For 4851, Madam Clerk, please call the roll on adopting the substitute. Senator? Senator Jones? Yes. Senator Shootmaker? Yes. Senator Rocca? Yes. Senator Bita? No. Mr. Chair, you have three yeas and one nay. Substitute is adopted. May I have a motion? Or I will make a motion to move House Bill 4851 S1 with a recommendation to build and pass. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Senator Jones? Yes. Senator Shootmaker? Yes. Senator Rocca? Yes. Senator Bita? No. Mr. Chair, you have three yeas and one nay. Bill is reported. I move to recommend immediate effect. Seeing no objection, the committee recommends immediate effect. We'll now take up House Bill 4853. I will make a motion to report House Bill 4853 with recommendation to build and pass. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Senator Jones? Yes. Senator Shootmaker? Yes. Senator Rocca? Yes. Senator Bita? Yes. Mr. Chair, you have four yeas and zero nays. Bill is reported. I move to recommend immediate effect without any objection. The committee recommends immediate effect. We'll now take up House Bill 4856. Uh, I move to report House Bill 4856 with recommendation the bill then pass. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Senator Jones? Yes. Senator Shoemaker? Yes. Senator Rocca? Yes. Senator Bita? Yes. Mr. Chair, you have four yeas and zero nays. Bill is reported. I make a motion to recommend immediate effect. See no objection. The committee will recommend immediate effect. We will now take up House Bills uh, 5225, 5498, 5499. Representatives Opsimer, LeBlanc, and France. Uh, colleagues, there is a substitute for consideration for House Bill 5499 is strictly a conflict sub and has not changed the intent of the legislation. We previously took testimony on these bills. <clears throat> I will now read in the cards. In support of the bill is uh, Isabel Terry, citizen from Rockford, Michigan. Opposing the bill is Chris Hawkins, Michigan State Police. Uh, opposing the bill is uh, Kathy Hedgian, of the Michigan Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence. Opposing the bill is Mary Lovick of the Michigan Domestic Violence Prevention Board and Treatment of Lansing.
who will now vote on these bills. I believe that uh, this needs to be debated by the entire Senate. So my intent is to vote these on these today. I will make a motion to report House Bill 5225 with recommendation the bill then passed. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Senator Jones? Yes. Senator Shoemaker? Yes. Senator Rocca? Yes. Senator Bita? No. Mr. Chair, you have three yeas and one nay. Bill is reported. I'll move to recommend immediate effect. Without any objection, the committee will recommend immediate effect. Now I'll take up House Bill 5498. I move with recommendation the bill then pass. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Senator Jones? Yes. Senator Shoemaker? Yes. Senator Rocca? Senator Bita? Yes. Mr. Chair, you have four yeas and zero nays. I will move to recommend immediate effect. Seeing no objection, the committee recommends immediate effect. I will now move to adopt the S-1 substitute to House Bill 5499. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Senator Jones? Yes. Senator Shoemaker? Yes. Senator Rocca? Yes. Senator Bita? Yes. Mr. Chair, you have four yeas and zero nays. Substitute is adopted. I will now move that House Bill 5499, S-1, with recommendation, the bill then pass. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Senator Jones? Yes. Senator Shoemaker? Yes. Senator Rocca? Yes. Senator Bita? Yes. Mr. Chair, you have four yeas and zero nays. I will now move to recommend immediate effect. Without any objection, the committee recommends immediate effect. We have no absent members and no further business in front of the committee. So there you have it. Uh, that is the official word from Senator Jones, the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, that uh, the House bills uh, afforded to the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act uh, as hashed out by the Michigan House Judiciary and John Walsh um, have now passed with amendments uh, at the Senate level. Um, and the amendments are going to have the effect of doing a number of things. Uh, obviously, uh, taking the Lara option, uh, actually taking the Lara mandate to privatize away, so now it's an option. It's also going to ban uh, all felons from being caregivers. A huge problem. I mean, somebody who's written a $200 bouncy check is guilty of a felony. Does this require that you should not be a caregiver? I mean, there are felonies all over the place for things that are just not you know, I suppose in uh, that are probably in conflict with uh, with that ideal. Also, uh, suspects uh, um, I, I take that back. People that are uh, applying uh, for uh, medical marijuana cards have to pay a fee to the state, and uh, that fee accumulates in an account. It was going to the general fund. This would segregate those funds into a separate account. Also, uh, this would ban out-of-state residents from having a Michigan medical marijuana card, as well as uh, make sure that uh, police do not have to have a warrant in order to access the registry. Some additional language was added, giving prosecutors, um, probation officers, judges, additional access to the registry. So these have all been uh, reported out of committee with amendment uh, this means it'll go to the Senate floor with recommendation for a vote. The Senate's going to uh, adopt these amendments and vote. And then uh, this is likely to go right back to a, you know, reconciliation committee. And then um, there may be a required vote on a couple of these bills on the House level, um, which apparently there has been a deal worked out already uh, with John Walsh on these uh, bills that would require that. Uh, those are likely to pass, and you're likely to see all of these uh, bills become law. If you're opposed to these bills, you should contact your state senator or legislator, your representative, today. Uh, you can find them very easily. Uh, they're on the Michigan Senate page. Uh, go to michigan.gov slash senate or michigan.gov slash house, and uh, you'll find the appropriate uh, contacts for your area. You can find your district, find your senator, find your representative and speak your mind on these bills. Otherwise, they are going to end up probably going down as law, and, and they may well anyway. Uh, that's our report today from the uh, Boji Tower in Lansing. 
Um, we're reporting from our uh, side studios in um, the, uh, well, I guess it'd be the, uh, I'm going to tell you where the side studios are at. <laughs> <laughs> Come and watch us on the Medical Marijuana Radio Show at RadioWeedShow.com at 1310 WDTW, Detroit's Progressive Talk. Thanks for watching.